talk's a bit more upbeat. <laughs> um, and I've taken um, I've taken Kathy's uh, discussed this with Kathy uh, prior to doing the presentation. And what I've spent the week doing is just kind of going back over my own intellectual um, uh, trajectory and working out kind of in my own mind, which I'd like to share with you, how I got to this particular position. So I actually want to start with um, paying respect to a great sociologist um, and teacher, Basil Bernstein, who had a particular vision for a sociology of education. And his vision of sociology of education wasn't just one about looking at social reproduction and issues of social inequality, but it was also to use theory to look at the way that schools and specifically pedagogic relations could play a role in interrupting social inequalities. Uh, I'm just going to put that up there and I'll explain what I mean by this. Um, Bernstein spent four decades developing a complex conceptual language that could generate delicate descriptions, and I take this phrase from Karen Julie, who was working with me at that time, of the way that pedagogic relations, a specialised form of social relations, not only have the potential to reproduce existing social inequalities, but also have the potential to disrupt inequalities. Now, talking about pedagogic relations, this isn't just teacher relations, this is forms of pedagogic communication, and I'll explain what I mean as I progress with the paper. His focus was on the differential distribution and acquisition of powerful forms of knowledge and ways of knowing, often only transmitted and acquired, he argued, through specialised modes of pedagogic communication, constituted in and through the technologies of the modern school. Now, Bernstein, like people, um, and people such as uh, cultural theorist uh, Ian Hunter, would have argued at that time, and were arguing at that time, that uh, the apparatus of the modern schooling emerged and evolved as a new technology for governing whole populations. Now, often when sociologists of education, writing about this literature, read these notions of governing, it's often read in a negative or a deficit way. Somehow it's a repressive institution. Sure, it does have that function, but it has other functions. And this is what Bernstein, following the kind of Durkheimian tra trajectory, tried to analyse in detail. Now, what he argued was within this institutional organisation, specialised modes of communication, pedagogic communication, were constituted to regulate the social and cognitive capacities of whole populations. So from this perspective, disciplinary knowledge is esoteric, sacred knowledge based upon symbolically condensed orders of meaning, which hold immense cognitive power. Induction or initiation into these condensed orders of meaning or esoteric knowledge is in <coughs> specialised forms of meaning, what Bernstein describes as an elaborated or elaborating code. Now, in the 1960s, when he actually made some of these claims, there was a whole debate and um, I'm sure Jim knows about it and other people in the room, that he was basically saying that, wait a minute, only the middle class have elaborating codes and the working class have these restricted codes, and wait a minute, elaborating codes really don't happen in schools. Completely missed the point. What he was actually trying to argue was, how do we initiate the next generation and different groups of the next generation into these complex forms of knowledge? What are the specialised modes of communication that we use to enable us to do that work. Now, in thinking through the core problem uh, in the discipline of sociology of education, which I understand to be how societies reproduce, change and transform themselves, this is the education, I want to acknowledge Rob Moore's latest book. And Rob was a student of um, uh, Bernstein's. He actually spent an incredible amount of time writing and, um, and interpreting Bernstein's work for, for other people. Um, and Bernstein, Sorry, Rob Moore writes about Bernstein, and I quote directly from him. In contrast to the homeostasis of the reproduction paradigm, Bernstein's problematic is that of transformations, because it looks both ways in terms of relations to and relations within. Now, when I'm using those terms, relations to and relations within, I'm using them at a very abstract level, so I'll have to unpack that further. But it is important to grasp that this duality which can only be thought in the form of an analytic distinction, is in practice the dual aspects of a single complex process. It's important to pause here and explain Bernstein's principles of the society, which he takes from Durkheim. As Rob Moore argues, it is important to grasp this concept analytically rather than concretely. He is not referring to a whole society, often equated with a political unit or a nation state. 
rather social principles, social relations, social order referred to, and again I quote Rob Moore, as an instance of prolonged association, whatever its boundaries in space or time. Now, in order to explain this complex sociological project of examining social principles or social relations that were both outside and inside the person, Bernstein invoked the metaphor of the Roman god Janus. I was going to hold trying to understand what he meant by this, but so let me see how I go here. Um, he argued the ambivalent, um, so Janus is, um, if you know anything about classical uh, uh, mythology, which I didn't, by the way, I started learning about it. Um, it has two faces. The two faces of Janus enable the god to watch entrances as well as exits and see into the internal as well as the external world. Left and right, above and below, before and after, for and against. The shrines of Janus were archways such as dark gateways or arcades at crossing places. That's taken directly from dictionary symbols. Now, this is a, a picture that Rob's got in his book, but I you know, quickly did my own internet search to try and understand it a bit better. <coughs> and I started seeing these images everywhere. So I thought this was really interesting. But Rob takes it a little bit further, um, Rob Moore, and he actually connects it to the, the Peter Hall bars. Now, I remember seeing this when I was at Teachers College of Advanced Education. My own training was in um, Townsville initially. But what the way that Bernstein's using it and the way that Rob is using it to try and explain Bernstein's big project about looking at relations to and relations within is this. When you look at the white, you see two faces looking in. And you have to kind of glance back and then you see the two faces looking out in the black. Yeah? Yes? <laughs> and you see a vase in the third space. Oh which is going to Gavin's point, here's the third space. <laughs> so you've got the two faces looking out, if I could actually point to it. Um, you kind of have to look back down and cut off the top part, the bars, and you see two faces pointing out. Can I use a point? Yes, I can. There. There. There's two faces pointing out there. Yeah. There's, um, just forget that head bit. And then there's two faces looking in, and then there's the bars in the middle, right? <laughs> the point of this, Bernstein was arguing, that often, particularly in the sociology of education, there's been a big focus of looking at relations to schooling institutions, but not looking at the relations within the specialised unit of schooling institutions or educational institutions, which in fact either reproduce or transform inequality. It's almost like the schooling institution became this black box. So you've got, it's either a racist institution or it's reproducing white middle class masculinist knowledge. And that's why these people keep getting this advantage without looking at the complex relations that, that have been formed and evolved over time in the specialised um, uh, institution, particularly in the specialised form of communication known as pedagogic communication. So, for Rob Moore, this image depicts not only this notion of relations to and relations within, but this other Durkheimian construct of the relation between sacred or esoteric knowledge and profane knowledge. And what he meant by that was the sacred knowledge was that knowledge that was in the disciplines that has been produced over time, which is what we're inducting uh, students through, uh, into through schooling institutions. A lot of them don't get it, um, and only a few do get it, as we know. Uh, the basic thesis of reproduction theory. And profane knowledge is every, every day, um, the everyday knowledge. What's happened, and if I go now to um, uh, Jim's point about this notion of deficit theory, it says we're not allowed to say that some students don't get access to that knowledge in a sense. We, sorry, we do say some students don't get access to the school knowledge, but wait a minute, their knowledge that they've already got in the everyday world and in the community is just as good as school knowledge and we need to respect that and bring more of that into the school. Well, what that ends up doing is actually denying those students the very complex knowledge that we're giving access to a lot of other students. Okay. In looking at some of these issues then, Bernstein himself says that there were four major papers that he wrote that impacted on on, um, sorry, were significant in terms of his own theorising. I've highlighted those four papers in the, in the bold there. Um, but as I was trying to think through this, there was another paper that he wrote way back in 1964, which was um, dealing with the specialised communication of psychotherapy. 
And again, he taught, treated that uh, psychotherapy or the communicative relationship within psychotherapy as a specialised pedagogic communication. So not to say, okay, only white people can benefit from it, only males can benefit or women, but what is this specialised communication which enables complex cognitive um, uh, knowledge to emerge to analyse the dynamics of that relationship and who gets access to it and who um, is denied it. Now, I'm going to start some of this theoretical work because that's fairly complex work um, because there's an issue that's troubled me for a long time. It's troubled me in the way that I've been inducted into the discipline of the sociology of education since the 1980s onwards. Um, and it was part of the reason why I've kind of gone down this particular trajectory. I want to keep going back to this notion of relations within and relations between that Bernstein uh, made his, his large project. And I want to do this by shifting my empirical gaze, and I do think there's an important relationship between theory and uh, empirical data, to the current ARC linkage project that I've got. Uh, and it was funded, um, my colleague is Kath Glaswell on that project, who's a social psychologist, and um, my other colleague is from New Zealand, Stuart McNaughton, and then we've been actually, our industry partner has been Education Queensland. So that research project actually emerged when I was head of school of the Gold Coast campus at uh, Griffith University. And I had in, um, in fact inherited um, a, a, a position in that school which had a direct link to an industry, to the industries um, at the Gold Coast, <coughs> as in the education industries. Um, they had actually set up a model of a tertiary education industry partnership and they called it my actual supervisor uh, for my own PhD had been Richard Smith and he had been a, a former head of school of, um, at the Gold Coast. But he had set up this industry group which he argued was based on a model of peer-to-peer -peer knowledge. Um, and it was supposed to be a peer-to-peer -peer knowledge generating process with the specific aim of producing collaborative knowledge to address a real world, pro a real world problem. Um, and that was uh, quality schooling to improve student learning outcomes. Now, in Bernsteinian language, that meant that there wasn't a strong demarcation between what went on within the School of Education and what went on in the schools. The communication flows were working both ways. Now, why was that significant for me at the time? And why did I find it really difficult to engage with, uh, with uh, TA initially? Um, and with trying to set up this ARC linkage pro program was because my own training, even though I had worked with, uh, with Richard Smith and I had read a lot of this Bernstein literature, was that I had also been immersed in critical theory. And my understanding of critical theory at the time um, was based on this kind of trajectory. So I had trained as a primary school teacher in North Queensland. I had taught predominantly in North Queensland and I'd studied part-time for my own B.Ed. studies at the University of Queensland, firstly in distance mode, and then when I moved to Brisbane in part-time mode. I worked with people like Richard Smith, who had done his own training in anthropology and sociology and had worked uh, with Peter Lawrence and done a lot of anthropological work in Papua New Guinea. At the time, we were introduced um, not only to the Bernsteinian work, but also to a lot of the work from critical theory which emerged from the Frankfurt School, and particularly the Marxist theories of Louis Althusser and Antonio Gramsci. I'm sure that you're all familiar with this. So there was that kind of sociology of education strain in my own disciplinary background, but at the same time there was this education psychology um, strain, but it was predominantly from a cognitive kind of orientation. There was little attention to the social psychology or the work of Marxist psychologists, particularly some of the psychologists that were emerging out of Russia at that time. And here I'm talking about the work of Golosinov, Luria, Vygotsky. So to try and connect the social psychology to the sociology in my own kind of trajectory was very, was quite difficult. So I ended up orientated more to the kind of sociology of Ed with that critical vein. And the way that I interpreted that was that um, one was focusing on the kind of social explanations for educational inequality and the other one was very focused on the individual and kind of intra, intrapersonal um, stuff at the time. Now, for me, um, the critical theory tra um, trajectory, and I remember being in, uh, in groups in, in Brisbane, in fact, studying critical theory and we'd meet at people's houses and analyse some of these complex texts. 
Um, but Al Tazir had a very prominent uh, kind of place in my own thinking at that time. Um, particularly uh, his notion of subject formation. Um, remember his notion of ideological interpolation or hailing? Mm -hmm. And the notion there was you know, that, that uh, fantastic phrase where um, Al Tazir says, you call some, a subject comes into being by that phrase, hey you, and then somebody turns 180 degrees and they recognise themselves. So the consciousness isn't just from within, it's from the social, social, um, the social order outside. Um, so it was, in through, it was through this kind of language or discursive structure that a person recognises themselves as concrete subjects. Ideology was thus a fundamental <coughs> condition of human consciousness. Indeed, Althusser's concept of ideological state apparatus constituted the possibilities of the thinkable within schooling institutions. The only room for individual agency and change within this framework was the, the distinction between general and particular ideologies, whereby general ideologies were common sense understandings of the thinkable and particular ideologies were interpretations of these. Boy, that didn't give much room for <laughs> any agency. Schools were agencies of reproduction and basically our job as critical theorists was to you know, kind of make this aware to everybody else. Um, second wave new sociology of, uh, of education, and now I'm talking about the period, about the, the 90s, and, um, uh, for me anyway, was, um, was basically trying to look, sorry, uh, late 80s and 90s, was trying to look at the structural determinants in the reproduction of class, and thus the labour force, social identities and cultures. Reproduction theorists emphasise the ideological functioning of all state institutions, particularly education, Teachers were theorised as agents of the state working in the bureaucracy of the state to reproduce particular types of students needed for the workforce. Student resistance was theorised as action which could not contest or transform the hegemonic practices of the state. Reproduction became the starting basis of the theory which postulated capitalist structures as invariant. Boy, that's pretty dismal. Uh, now, according to Carmen, Luke and Rob Moore, this structural determinist position emerged as a response to what was happening in the 1970s, and this was the initial work of um, Michael F. D. Young, etc., which was trying to introduce a phenomenological perspective on school knowledge and relations. And here I'm quoting from Carmen Luke, uh, where she says, the emphasis in that, that first sociology of education movement in the 70s was on agency, reality, interaction, and lived experience as co-constitutive constitutive of the production of meaning. It was assumed that once educators took into account children's differential subjectivities and background knowledge, schooling could be transformed and students' class-based failure remediated. So you had this kind of movement um, of the new sociology of education in the 70s. You've got this kind of structural um, critique of that and saying, wait a minute, you can't actually get that change because, um, because of this, the, the structures that are going to reproduce inequality. Following that, there was a, a lot of critique of the critical theorists um, work and uh, the two key texts that I'm thinking about there that actually influenced me at that time, apart from all the Bernstein stuff, and I'm just going to give you a break by just showing you all the, the legacy of the, of the work there, because it wasn't just one or two books, but it was the enormous amount that he wrote, but also people's doing, people writing interpretations of the Bernstein work, which continues now too. Um, there's a uh, annual, sorry, biannual, that's not right, a conference every two years on, um, on the Bernstein theoretical work. And this, this is the uh, kind of trajectory of the Vygotsky work. Now, what, I'm, um, what I've been particularly interested in was this critique of the limitations of our critical theory. And the texts that, for me, at that time were really prominent were um, Elsewhere's work, uh, we actually tried critical pedagogy in our own classroom and said, well, why isn't this you know, um, empowering for me? Um, but another text which I don't think was taken up a lot in, um, in sociology of education circles, and it was from really cultural studies, it was Ian Hunter's work. And Ian Hunter did a Foucauldian analysis of the formation of the modern school, um, and particularly looking at the very notion of pastoral pedagogy. And I quote here from... Uh, Ian Hunter, where he says, 
And remember, critical theorists were not only critiquing the way that uh, schools reproduce inequality, but they were then basically urging teachers to become critical or radical educators themselves so that they could actually raise students' consciousness and that way that was going to actually bring about significant change. And what Ian Hunter said was, this figure of the radical educator seems to be the product of no definite social organisation and no particular history. This may seem surprising, and here this is very similar to what Jim's saying, given the belief in the dialectical relation between ideas and their social determination comes close to being a status doctrine in the teaching profession. The, the best that this mode of self-reflection can manage is to place a radical teacher in the gigantic shoes of the subject of history, the place where the subject, in comprehending its own social determination, frees itself and begins to transform society into an expression of subjectivity. It is no mark of disrespect to suggest that these shoes are too big for a teacher. These, two, these shoes are too big for anyone. So, there was this critique of critical theory, um, and in fact, not only at that time, what I tended to do was not only look at that kind of critique, because it actually really resonated with me, but also some, uh, some current critiques of uh, critical theory, uh, which have just come out, which are actually criticising a lot of the kind of stance um, that's been taken about some of the education policies. Uh, that have been introduced by Labor governments to try and make a difference in terms of educational inequality. And a lot of those, um, a lot of the kind of critiques of those policies are basically start and end with the notion of neoliberalism is a bad thing. Here are examples of neoliberal policies and see they're doing the same kind of bad thing. Okay, um, from the kind of critical theory um, angle, there was actually a, a splintering um, within the whole critical theory um, sociology of education tradition. I'm going to run out of time. Oh, I think you've got that ten. Um, and there was a take up of um, the notion of identity politics in sociology of education. The way it became interpreted was the um, the post structuralist version of um, sociology of education. Now, I wrote about this in 2001. Um, but what it seemed to me at that stage, uh, and again, Karen's very um, aware of this, we were reading this material together at the time, but a lot of these articles were from cultural studies frame, and they were actually looking at issues of identity um, and trying to problematise the notion of, of identity at the time. But what happened with the way, for me, that they got taken up in sociology of education was that pedagogy that started getting these different names. So it was almost like each pedagogy had a different <coughs> voice. And it produced an abundance of pedagogies to accommodate the different kind of social categories. So we had feminist pedagogies, and we had um, post-colonial pedagogies, and we had queer pedagogies, and we had, and it just went on and on, like a proliferation of different pedagogies or a naming of pedagogies, but not really actually analyzing what was the different kinds of specialised communication within that pedagogy that was supposed to make a difference to these different uh, different categories of of, um, of disadvantaged people. More and more, are, more and more, and a number of other Bernsteinian scholars have criticised that work and basically said it became a sociology of knowers and their relationships, and it actually started fragmenting the whole sociology of education on that kind of critical critical side. So this takes me to my current position. Trained in the kind of Bernsteinian, Durkheimian trajectory of sociology of education, influenced heavily by the kind of critical theory. So at points it was almost like I lost sight of some of the, uh, the Bernstein stuff and kind of veered to the critical theory, which is that notion of the bars I want to kind of point out again. Um, it's kind of like you look at one thing and you forget this other thing. It's, it's almost hard to hold all those three perspectives together at the same time, even in the way that I was trying to understand some of these things. Until, and I'm not even saying I've got it right here, until um, when I was in that the head of school position, we ended up getting a large ARC linkage grant. And that ARC linkage grant um, basically was concerned about uh, low uh, students' literacy achievement in a cluster of schools in the Logan Corridor. 
Uh, at the time, uh, the person who was the, the, um, the director of the region, as part of the industry group that was working with the school, basically confronted me as the head of school and said, well, what are you actually doing to help us and our teachers to address this social problem? We can see the data is really bad. Um, in NAPLAN, the, the students' literacy is way below the mean. Um, you've got a whole bunch of people here in the school. How can you actually work collaboratively with us? Now, the team that we actually tried to put together there then uh, considered, consisted of, uh, of myself, and I was coming from the sociology of education frame, social psychologists, um, and then people working within the department who had a lot of access to that data. So we were particularly interested in the ways in which patterns of social relations or modes of communication become internalised and shape consciousness and the ways in which such internal processes or understandings, or what Bernstein would say, orientations to meaning, shape outer patterns of communication. So in very abstract terms, we were interested in forging new partnerships between the university researchers um, and, the, um, and the schools in order to produce a new model of uh, research engagement. So, let me go back. We were interested in, yes, there are all of these new policies that are coming out, they are very data focused, they are very data driven, they're actually doing what Jim's saying, yes, they're saying blaming teachers, they're wanting to uh, do that kind of work. But at the same time, we were interested in, how <coughs> do we mitigate some of the educational inequality that was happening in these schools in a partnership um, through this notion of collaborative inquiry where we looked at the relations within the schooling institution and our relationships to those schooling institutions and the relationship of those schooling institutions to the local community. So we were interested in the possibilities of collaborative inquiry to do that work. Now, this then gave, led to the problematic of theory, which is very, very abstract in the Bernsteinian uh, kind of framework, and what was actually happening out in schools. And we went back to Bernstein, and we weren't going to use it, the theory as a tool. There was no way you could use some of this stuff about relations to or relations within and just say to teachers, hey, here's a theory, here's a book, you know, take this with you. It was more as a way of trying to explore, to work out what was going on, to develop a kind of framework to work with the teachers. We were also interested in this article that I've just referred to, um, which was in the journal Sociology, this notion of disclosure. Um, and I don't know whether I completely agree with everything that's said in that uh, article, but he talks about this notion of disclosure rather than unmasking. And the unmasking he associates with that critical notion that somehow we know, we've got all the answers because we've got the theory, and we're going to kind of say, well, you know, you teachers are not doing your job properly, it's because you're either constructing students as deficit or whatever, to this notion of disclosure as understanding is, um, is not confined to agents in terms of reference. I'll let you read the rest. And then he elaborates and says it's this notion of a, a tertiary understanding. Now I'm just going to give a particular example of that with um, this data. When we first went into the schools, and I have written about this myself, so and I'm not, I kind of look at my own work and think. Um, the teachers were saying some of the things that uh, that is about readily in the literature, you know, these kids are from low socioeconomic backgrounds, they don't know how to read, there's all this kind of deficit talk. Now we could have just taken that and said, yes, it's the teacher's fault and it's deficit talk. But what this project tried to do was hold on to what they were trying to say, make sense of what they were say, saying, that's just Bernstein's complex stuff, so we'll go back into that later. Hold on to that. Um, and say, well, what, why are they saying that? What's going on? Are we going to automatically just read it as this, these teachers are doing deficit talk? What's actually going on here? And when we held on to that notion with those teachers and unpacked it, it became, it was almost like that their own ability to cope in that environment was so overwhelming that it was kind of, they had to blame something. The blame was projected outwards. So when we started then showing them how to make sense of the data, how to actually interpret the data, 
uh, we actually showed that the principles how to work with the NAPLAN data. What did that data mean? We actually sat down and developed a team to work with the school. So we had our research team from the university. So in a sense, what I'm trying to say is what we ended up doing is developing a different social division of labour, or in Bernstein's terms, a different kind of social order for doing this work with schools. We had our research team. I couldn't do the work with the school-based researchers, but what we did was we trained or educated our um, research assistants to spend an enormous amount of time sitting in those schools working with the teachers. We had the educational practitioners at the principal's level, at the curriculum level, and at the classroom teacher level. So it wasn't just a research project where we went and collected a bit of data, went away, analysed it. It actually took a very different form. This is the kind of model that we ended up setting up. Um, so it wasn't that we were just looking at, let's fix up this one individual teacher. We were trying to look at it at different levels, at the school culture, at patterns of classroom instruction, and trying to understand student achievement data. We put the school-based researchers in at every level to try and work with the teachers and the school leaders to actually understand this data, to make sense of it, and to construct a different kind of specialised pedagogic communication. So, we had these different phases. The first phase was the data collection, analysis and inquiry. This notion that somehow, um, my problem with some of the kind of critical theory stuff was that, yes, we, could, we wanted teachers to become critical theorists and radical pedagogues. It was almost like we wanted them to mimic us. See, we've got these skills and if you've got those skills, you'll also see the oppressive stuff that's going on. This model was quite different. What we tried to work out was where were the teachers at? Why were they making some of these assumptions about the local community? Some of that stuff that I talked about in terms of identity politics. What, how did they read this data, the NAPLAN data? What, how did they make sense of it? And instead of just using the NAPLAN data because it wasn't an effective uh, diagnostic test, my colleagues, and that's not me because I don't certainly have that kind of social psychology background, brought in the TORCH testing data instrument to actually get the teachers to look at where the, the students could read effectively, where they couldn't, what kinds of skills did they need to develop with, they, with these students. The kind of professional learning that these teachers needed in order to work together to actually design pedagogic communications that would work effectively with the students. And here I don't mean that they were, they had a fancy name like they were post-colonial or feminist or anything like that. It was what kind of strategy will work with these students here and how can we build them up so that they can become effective readers. Now, what that also involved was a division of labour where we actually had ongoing meetings at every level. So the rolling meetings were one-to-one -one meetings with the teachers by the school-based researchers. I wasn't involved with that where they actually systematically sat down with them and analysed that data, made sense of that data, and said, what is that data telling you about that particular student? How do you have to design your pedagogic communication to assist that student to improve their reading comprehension? Those kinds of skills. And then the whole school got together to actually look at that data, to open it up, to open up the conversations about pedagogic communication. The, the 12 schools got together to have those conversations and then we shared that knowledge with the schools in, um, in New Zealand. And in all, now this project, sorry, took an enormous amount of money. It wasn't the ARC providers, it was something like half a million dollars, but the industry partner invested um, about $800,000 as well. So it was a lot of investment and it's ended. The issue that Jim raised about sustainability is, is a real serious issue here. Um, but what I want to go on to was that it did actually make a difference. Um, now, this is the, the test results in terms of, um, of, of literacy for the, different, uh, sorry, for the different clusters over different times, and the mean is in the blue. Now, basically and very simply, when we started the project, the students' literacy levels were way below the mean, and you can actually see that they have been increasing over time. The glitches are, bit, are the, those variables that were out of school time. So for example, the students went on holidays and then when there was a retesting, uh, obviously the, um, the reading, well it's not obvious, but the reading had dropped. And then we had to think of other ways of trying to keep that reading um, uh, level improving. Now, all I want to do, because I have to finish soon, mm -hmm. and get me to the next one, is just show you, no I won't, I just want to end by saying that it did actually um, make a huge difference to the, um, 
uh, the community. Now the problem for us is one of sustainability. How do we actually uh, continue on with the sustainability? Could I have done this project without understanding some of that complex Bernsteinian theory and also the social psychology theory? I don't think so. Um, I actually need to do a lot of that kind of work to write up a lot of a lot of the project. Stephen's um, in the audience there, and he was there collecting the data with us. The division of labour in the team was such that I didn't do a lot of that actual work of the professional development. That was Pat Glaswell and colleagues. But I was involved in collecting a lot of the interview data at the end and trying to make sense of it and interpret it and write it up for publication. So, and I think we needed that different kind of division of labour for that project to take the shape that it has. And that was <coughs> Okay, well, um, the theory that I'm finding most useful at the moment is um, Baudieu's theory of reproduction. And the reason that is, is I'm working in the field of law. Um, and in Australian and English common law, uh, the doctrine of stare decisis involves looking backward at precedent. And that tends to lend itself to reproducing practices and reproducing concepts over a very long period of time, and I'm finding that quite useful in my research. What do I call a, a group of sociologists of education? I call them a murder. A murder because they always try to pick the eyes out of dead things. I was looking at the, what theory are you finding useful and why, and in my research study, I actually tried sociocultural perspective and it didn't work for me. And then I tried uh, identity, contemporary identity, and it just, some part of it is there, but it wasn't really addressing fully my research. So what I um, now find it very useful is a really uh, ecological perspective of, of language. So ecology of language is very powerful and have a great deal of, um, of, of factors to tap into, to fit into what I'm looking at. So social ecology, ecology of language, I find it very useful for my research. I'm, I'm doing a community language school program, looking into the decline or the uptake of language education by uh, school aged children in Illawarra. It's a focus study. The main question that I had um, about the theory, you know, using theory in sociology of education is you know, how far can you take the pragmatic approach of usefulness? You know, usefulness in uh, uh, explanatory power or usefulness in actually changing practices in, in real life situations um, when there are so many. And uh, I'm just starting, so I guess I'll, I don't know whether I'll find an answer. As a thesis examiner, the kinds of thing I'm looking for in a theoretical frame and when assessing that theoretical frame is really the kinds of story that it tells um, to the research data and back again. I'm looking for a really interesting story that helps me to see the, the problem, the project and the research process in a new and exciting way and I want to see that a student understands the theory both in its historical sense, its contemporary sense and how it speaks to a future and that's really what I'm is there anything else you want to add? To that? Yep. No, I thought I'd keep it nice.